you can support In the Past Lame by buying some of our merchandise. We've got merch with quotations from famous people in history, like Abraham Lincoln, fellow citizens, we cannot escape history, and Confucius, who said, study the past if you would control the future. And we've got some snarky ones, too, like one of our bestsellers that says, Dear America, okay, I'm begging you, stop repeating this shit. Signed, History. You can get these designs and many more on everything from a t-shirt or a hoodie to a coffee mug or a beach towel. Just go to our website, inthepastlane.com, and click on Merchandise. Thanks. We the people of the United States, in order to form a more perfect huddled union, masses yearning to breathe Consider free. that we shall be as a city upon a hill. That all men and women are created equal. Give me liberty or give me death. Nobody's free until everybody's free. And the government of the people, by the people, for the people, shall not perish from the earth. Hi there. Welcome to In the Past Lane, the podcast about American history and why it matters. Brought to you by SBI, Snoring Beagle International, and coming to you from the Conscription Act Studios located in central Massachusetts. I'm your host, historian at large, Edward T. O'Donnell, and this is episode 198. So what's happening in the past lane this week? Well, not too much to report these days that differs from recent updates. I'm spending most of my time planning for the challenges we'll face this coming fall term, which, by the way, gulp, is only six weeks away. My college, Holy Cross College in Worcester, Massachusetts, has opted to allow all students who want to to return to campus. But classes will be offered in a variety of forms, ranging from in-person, with lots of precautions in place, to entirely online classes, and also a third category called a hybrid class that combines the two. Some of it will be in-person, some of it will be online. For me, I'm teaching a seminar with 12 students, so at this point I'm planning to teach in-person. But we shall see, as we have no idea what the status of the pandemic will be come late August. And at the moment, looking pretty good here in Massachusetts, but not so good elsewhere. Like I said, we'll see. On a brighter note, I want to take a moment to thank those of you who recently stepped up to financially support the podcast via Patreon or PayPal. Thank you to Chris G., Kent C., Nancy C., James L., and K. Dennis. I really, really appreciate the support. All of it goes for paying for the costs of making this podcast. Thank you, and also thanks to everyone else who's been a supporter over the years. All right, let's get on with it. Here's a key event that happened this week in American history. On July 13th, 1863, 157 years ago this week, the streets of New York exploded in a violent episode known as the Draft Riots. It lasted four days and claimed the lives of more than 100 people and destroyed millions of dollars in property, all while the Union struggled to defeat the Confederacy on the battlefield. The event terrified Northerners, many of whom were convinced that it was a result of a Confederate plot, which it turned out it was not. The riots also prompted the Lincoln administration to rush thousands of troops from the battlefield at Gettysburg to New York City. To this day, the draft riots remain the greatest civil uprising in American history. At the outset of the Civil War in 1861, no one in the North or South could have imagined that there would ever be a shortage of volunteers that would necessitate a military draft. Union and Confederate Army recruiting stations were overwhelmed by men eager to join the fight. Few of them expected the war to last more than a few weeks. But subsequent events made clear just how unrealistic those hopes were. Beset by a series of incompetent generals and a host of other problems, the Union's Army of the Potomac in the East performed poorly in the field. By mid-1862, it was clear that the war would be long and very, very bloody. Later that year, Lincoln issued the Emancipation Proclamation, which effectively announced the eventual abolition of slavery. Lincoln had deemed emancipation necessary to win the war, but it also produced intense opposition among certain groups of Northerners. War weariness, not to mention anti-war sentiment, rose in the North, and soon Union Army recruiting stations were empty. If Lincoln was to make good on his promise to preserve the Union at all costs, a second drastic measure was needed. And so, in March 1863, Congress passed the Conscription Act, the first of its kind in U.S. history, which declared that all male citizens and immigrants that had applied for citizenship, aged 20 to 45, eligible to be drafted into the Union Army. If drafted, a man had several options to escape serving in the Union Army. He could pay what was called a commutation fee of $300 to the government which would basically buy his way out of serving. Or he could hire a substitute to serve in his place. Or he could just disappear 
something that more than 20% of draftees did. The draft, like emancipation, proved intensely controversial. Some opponents denounced it as an affront to democratic liberty. The government was going to force people to fight? Others focused on what they termed its aristocratic provisions that allowed wealthy people to buy their way out of service. That $300 commutation fee exceeded the annual income of most poor laborers. More and more, these people argued, it was becoming a rich man's war and a poor man's fight. The draft also incited anger among those Northerners, principally Democrats, who had initially been willing to support a war to preserve the Union, but who now balked at the idea of fighting a war for emancipation. Many politicians in the years before the war had used the issue of emancipation and the specter of cheap African-American labor flooding northern cities to rally urban workers, especially the Irish, to the Democratic Party. The message to the Irish was clear. If you think it's tough earning a living now, just wait until you have to compete with hundreds of thousands of black workers willing to toil for less money. It was a racist, opportunistic message of fear that ignored the fact that for the past 30 years, it had been Irish immigrants who had taken jobs from free blacks living in northern cities. Nonetheless, it stoked racist animosity among the Irish and other poor white workers. When the draft began in July, opposition to it turned violent. Violence broke out in Boston, Troy, New York, Worcester, Ohio, Portsmouth, New Hampshire, and many other cities. The worst incidents of anti-draft violence, of course, occurred in New York City. The first day of the draft, Saturday, July 11th, resulted in 1,236 names being drawn. And despite grumblings and rumors of protest, it ended without incident. The plan was to resume the draft on Monday morning. Discontent among working-class New Yorkers was palpable on Saturday night and on Sunday, as people poured over the lists of the men drafted and found names of men they knew. Conspicuously absent were names of any wealthy or prominent New Yorker. The mood in the city's working-class tenement districts grew ugly by Sunday night. Signs that there would be trouble when the draft resumed emerged early Monday morning when crowds of workers, among them a large percentage of Irish immigrants and Irish Americans, formed and began moving north towards the draft office at East 46th Street and 3rd Avenue. And the weather was hot and humid, prime conditions, experts say, for a riot. By the time the draft office opened, an angry crowd of 5,000 had gathered in the surrounding streets. Moments after the first names were drawn, the crowd stormed the office, destroyed the lottery wheel used to draw the names, and set the building on fire. The riot was on. The violence at the draft office at East 46th Street quickly spread throughout the city. To stymie efforts to restore order, crowds built barricades, they tore up streetcar tracks, and cut telegraph lines. As in most riots, the crowds that coursed through the streets did not engage in purely random acts of violence. Instead, they focused on very carefully chosen targets that symbolized their grievances. Anything associated with the Union Army came under attack, including recruiting stations and draft offices. Rioters also attacked anything associated with the Republican Party, which they viewed as the party of war, emancipation, and the draft. Both the New York Times and New York Tribune, staunchly pro-Republican and pro-war papers, were attacked several times. In addition, rioters also attacked the wealthy, people they derided as $300 men who were able to buy their way out of the draft. Mansions on Fifth Avenue were sacked and burned, as was the Brooks Brothers store. Rioters also took out their anger on local symbols of authority, most especially members of the New York City Police Department. And rioters also assaulted and killed African Americans. One of the very first institutions attacked was the Colored Orphans Asylum, located near the present-day New York Public Library on 42nd Street. Rioters burned it to the ground, but amazingly, none of the children or staff inside were killed. Other African Americans, however, were not so fortunate. At least 11 blacks were lynched by the rioters. Many of these lynchings included particularly savage acts, including burning and dismemberment. One of the reasons the rioting escalated and spread so quickly was that New York City had only a minor military presence, made up primarily of injured soldiers recovering from their wounds. When they turned out to quell the violence, they were quickly scattered by the much larger mob. Squads of police were likewise attacked and driven away. With the mob in control of the streets of the Union's largest city, officials sent frantic telegrams to Washington, D.C., pleading for troops. Late Monday night, on the first day of the rioting, the heavens opened up and the city was deluged in a most welcome downpour. The rain extinguished most of the fires, preventing a much larger conflagration from developing. It also drove the rioters indoors for the night. <laughs> 
city officials hoped the relatively peaceful night meant the riot was over. But Tuesday morning brought more steamy weather and renewed rioting. Again, African Americans, Republicans, soldiers, policemen, and the wealthy came under attack. But increasingly, the original focus of the rioting, protest against a class bias draft and a war for emancipation, had expanded to include widespread looting and score settling by the city's poor and marginalized underclass who seized on the riot as an opportunity to vent their rage at a system that they viewed as oppressive and unjust, not unlike the rioting we've witnessed in 2020. On Wednesday, day three of the riots, the tide began to turn as the first of several thousand troops arrived, fresh from the smoldering fields of Gettysburg. All day Wednesday and Thursday, they stormed the rioters' strongholds, using howitzers loaded with grape shot to mow down the crowd. In some neighborhoods, they engaged in fierce hand-to-hand combat as they moved from building to building. By now, the police had also regrouped and began to retake streets and make arrests. By Thursday night, the violence had ceased, and it appeared the riot might be over. When the sun arose on Friday morning, July 17th, New York City awoke wondering if the draft riots would resume. But all was quiet, except for the steady procession of people to the midtown residence of Archbishop John Hughes, the leader of the city's Irish Catholics. In handbills distributed all across the city the day before, he announced that he would address the crowd from the balcony outside his residence. Hughes delivered a message that expressed sympathy with the rioters' grievances, but urged them to cease the violence. The reputation of the Irish in America, he said, was at stake. When he concluded, the crowd broke up and went home without incident. The draft riots were over. In the aftermath of the riot, city officials tallied up the damage and death toll. 100 buildings lay in ashes, part of more than $5 million in property destroyed. Of the hundreds arrested for their role in the riot, only 67 were convicted at trial, most receiving sentences of around five years in prison. As for the number killed, some early estimates range from several hundred to several thousand. These exaggerated figures were clearly the result of the shock and horror produced by the riot, as well as anti-Irish sentiment. But the most accurate assessment of the riot's death toll, one based on a close reading of the press and death certificates, put the toll at 119. As noted, among those killed were at least 11 African Americans. The racial pogrom aspect of the riot led more than half the city's black residents to flee, it would be years before the city's black population returned to its pre-war level. Not surprisingly, the city's Irish population came in for harsh condemnation in the wake of the riot. A seething voice of indignation emanated from pulpit, meeting hall, and editorial page that denounced the Irish for engaging in a treasonous riot against the government as it struggled to win a civil war. Most of these critics ignored the fact that many of the rioters were not Irish, but rather German immigrants and German Americans, not to mention men of American birth. They also ignored the fact that many Irish soldiers, policemen, and priests helped stop the rioting. In the wake of the violence, city and state officials came up with a plan that eliminated the draft as a source of social unrest. They appropriated $2 million to pay the $300 fee for anyone who was drafted but did not want to serve. And so, when the draft resumed on August 19th, about a month after the rioting, there was no violence. Because there was a war that had to be won, New Yorkers and Americans in general did their best to forget about the draft riots. This became even easier once the war ended in Union victory. No one wanted to be reminded that the path to victory had been marred by disunity, protest, and violence. But the draft riots never quite disappeared from public consciousness, especially among America's wealthy citizens, who viewed it as a nightmarish spectacle of social unrest that haunted their minds for several generations to come. For Irish Americans, their widely publicized role in the riots remained a black mark on their collective reputation for decades to come. For African Americans, the draft riots endured as a harrowing reminder of the depths of racial animosity in American life. It was not the first incident of massive anti-black violence, and it surely would not be the last. Well, that's going to do it for In the Past Lane this week. You can learn more about me and everything we talked about at InThePassLane.com. And let's interact via social media. I'm at InThePassLane on both Twitter and Instagram, and our Facebook page is InThePassLane Podcast. See you next week. SBI, Snoring Beagle International. 